do I <laughs> fight against academia or the institution or should I work together? So there, there are different tension, I believe, and then also these blurry lines. How do we entangle them to have quality research, but also make a difference? Hello, and welcome to the Fourth Space podcast. For this episode, we were thrilled to work with Jean-Vievre Grégoire Lebrec, a Concordia public scholar, PhD candidate in the Indy program, to bring three scholars, Vivek Venkatesh, Jennifer Dancroix, and Kathleen Magnon, together here at Fourth Space for a discussion that Jean-Vievre has titled, Untangling the Blurry Lines of Engaged Research. And the idea was to ask scholars from different horizons, how they attempt to balance the roles, dilemmas, and challenges of being an engaged scholar with the hope of doing more quality research, but also having a better research life. Thanks for listening. And we would like to begin by acknowledging that Fourth Space and Concordia University are located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Cayuncahaga Nation is recognized as custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather. And Chichage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. We respect the continued connections with the past, the present, and the future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Thank you for inviting me here this week to do this event. You have introduced me briefly, but I would like to also introduce briefly the guest that I'm here with. So um, as you mentioned, Vivek Venkatesh is here with me. He's a prof at Concordia University at the Department of uh, Arts Education. I'm also joined by uh, Kathleen Mannion, Associate Professor at the School of Humanitarian Studies at Royal Roads in BC, and uh, Jennifer Dankwa, PhD candidate at Wolfsburg University uh, in Germany. So in the last year, I have realized how engaged in the community I was through my research, and I realized I had deep ties with the community, but also was aiming at making some changes. And that type of research was actually creating some <laughs> reflection and and I was wondering about my ethical stance, my boundaries, and um, I thought I need to untangle all the blurriness of, of that type of research I, I am doing, and I called it engage research. So I would like to start with the question, what does it mean for you to be an engaged scholar or to do engaged research? Is that even a term that you're comfortable using? Well, I never really thought of myself as an engaged scholar, so I was curious as to why I was asked to be part of this uh, event. So in our initial conversations, you explained how your conceptualization of the term engaged uh, perhaps converged with some of the actions that I've taken. The piece that draws me to the term engaged is trying to find a way to break down certain hegemonic, cultural, and social very, very importantly, political and then economic practices that have tainted the ways in which I have been trained as a researcher and which I'm trying to shed now in, I think, a very new, exciting and a very scary role as an engaged researcher. I too came to the invitation curious because it's not a term that I have used in the past. The reason I come to academia is because of research. I'm interested in, in research, but particularly research that makes a difference. So I think it is a really useful way of framing the work we do. And I really love that you framed it in looking at the blurry lines as well, because the value of it is not just for me as a scholar, or an academic or a researcher, but for the people that I'm working with. I happen to work at a university that privileges that scholarship that is community-based, that is looking to make changes with communities. And that's not always the case. So again, that it, that's a privilege in terms of where I'm situated, that I have an institution behind me that supports that kind of work. For me, it was the same. I was talking to, to Jen, uh, Jennifer, and I was thinking about, okay, how can I contribute? Um, what do you mean by engaged? As I'm defining myself as a Black woman, for example, so I'm already engaging in somehow or um, interrupting somehow um, ways of thinking that 
in Germany, it's not so common that Black women do academia, for example. But this is also linked to the topic that I'm working on, and it's on adult education and racism and how you can diminish or work against racism in adult education. I'm in companies, I'm in different social organizations, um, I'm on panels, I give interviews, and I think that's the way that I do engage research because I'm communicating what I'm researching on, and that's the ways I would say that I'm engaging. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. So again, I hear so many ways of being uh, engaged. So through topics that we chose to work on, through the, the ways we do research, the unlearning we do as researchers. So there's all these blurry lines and the broad range of doing engaged research. And I, I have found that also in, in my work in the way I engage with children or young people and the way I also after report back this tension between engaging with the community and bring it back to academia and this tension of do I fight against academia or the institution or should I work together? So there, there are different tension, I believe, and, and also, yeah, these blurry lines. How do we untangle them to have quality research, but also make a difference? So there's, I guess, two broad axes that I can address. But I think the one that tempts me the most after having heard you frame the issue would be, how do I position myself as an engaged researcher within academia? The second piece would be, what are the practices that I've engaged in with communities, what have I learned with communities? What, uh, what have they uh, constructed with our teams to move forward? But within academia, I think I perceive the most tensions. And part of this, I guess, is, is related very closely to a fraud syndrome that I suffer from with regards to the work I'm conducting. I'm not trained to work in prevention of violence or prevention of discrimination. And by training, I mean the, the higher education graduate studies that I undertook were firmly grounded in mathematics. So I worked in educational psychology, educational technology, but I focused specifically on building statistical models. You know, I, I think it was, it was all right. It wasn't earth shattering uh, in terms of the, the work that was produced, but I did feel a certain sense of emptiness in terms of the work I was pursuing from a personal standpoint. So coming to terms with that, but also coming to terms with the deep impact on my mental health that I had suffered as a result of a, of a loss when I was very young, I lost a, a family member to a terrorist attack. Learning to process that and then thinking through, okay, I'm in a position where I can actually make a difference it's not that the work I'm doing now and that I'm trained to do isn't making that difference, but it doesn't appeal to me. And if I can't see myself doing this work and take pleasure from it to a modest extent, then I really don't want to pursue the field of academia. So the, the question of engagement in academia is very, very closely tied to my motivation to work within that particular field. But herein comes that tension because there are gatekeepers. There are gatekeepers within paradigmatic conventions. And even if paradigms of research, of methodologies, of theory building, even if those are progressing, changing, regressing sometimes, I'm still up against a whole slew of people who have rightfully worked very, very hard in this particular field. And I've sort of, I'm working myself in as a peripheral participant to use a to use a management related term right and whether I'm legitimate or not is completely up to whether I have lived up to the expectations of the academia and I think that's where part of my engagement still remains in flux because I have chosen and with the immense privilege I have of being a full professor and having a research chair and directing a research center here at Concordia, I've chosen to say, you know what, fuck that. I'm going to think really more carefully about who is it that I want to work with? Who is it that I want to learn with? And in what ways can I transfer this engagement to the groups of people whom I can create a legacy with, right? So this is a specific decision I've made and the engagement then is grounded purely in the interactions, the collaborations, the successes, 
and the failures, not to keep them as binary, but that whole spectrum of work with the communities. So my master is the community who we serve, who we learn from. And I guess rhetorically, I come back and I guess I raise my hand when necessary and speak about the work that we're doing. So that I think frames this edginess that I feel and the tension that I feel, which I'm comfortable with. But, um, but yeah, it does take, it does take a, a risk. Thank you, Vivek. So I hear this risk, this tension, but this personal choice to, to situate oneself and, and to make allies. So the master is the community, as, as you mentioned. So I don't know if that resonates with, with you, Jennifer, or, or Kathleen, in your work, this, this tension. And have you chosen a side or chosen a posture that you're comfortable with to move forward in your research, but also in, in your daily life as a, you know, an individual part of a community. Maybe another point first, more related to the beginning um, of what Vivek said, um, that um, a personal motivation or incident may choose oneself to engage in research and um, then also with society and the community. And um, I think there's also this um, tension or a problem because from people that I know that are engaged, if you use now the term, there's a personal motivation. Also for me, I, I want that the society changes. So it's my personal approach to lead to change what, what I'm doing. I think that more or together academia and engaged scholars, maybe those um, to get those both together is more that we acknowledge in academia more the engagement with the community and with the society. And yes, there has to be a bigger meaning than just peer reviewing articles. What is the bigger aim of your research and what do you want to change with what you are doing? Also, there should be maybe more funds or positions, communicators, maybe community communicators or activators, or I don't know, which are specifically working also between academia and community and society. Thank you, Jennifer. What you said is so connected with what I just said before we started the discussion. Vivek has asked me, oh, what are you, what are you doing this week for your residency as a public scholar? And, uh, and I said, well, you know, I have to focus on my PhD. I've done so many things outside academia, but now um, I have to focus on it and move forward. So it resonates with, with me that the other extracurriculars, if we can say that, are not necessarily considered part of the research trajectory. And on, on that note, um, Kathleen and I have worked together in the last year on this uh, huge uh, initiative um, to amplify youth voices for um, a better future around environment and climate change. And, and this was, you know, just slightly on the border of research, but not really research. So I, I will... Uh, pass the talking stick to Kathleen and, and see what, what she thinks about this tension and the personal motivation to, to move forward and how it connects with academia. For me, my background is in social work. So I came from being in the community, working with individuals within the community, working in policy making, and then I came to academia. So I came a different route than what would normally be expected. And I came to academia because I saw that there was a real space uh, that is on the edge of traditional research and more artistic-based, participatory, more action-based research where you could make a difference. Thinking about the skills that I have made more sense for me to be able to support in that space, in that edginess of, of research. Uh, and that's what drew me to academia. So I also see a lot of the barriers that exist within particularly uh, traditional institutions. I found one that I work for, as I said, who supports this kind of research that is less research-like and more community activism-like, and that's been fantastic. But I still come up against those barriers every now and then. Again, it comes back to that personal motivation of why am I doing this? What is what is giving me joy and it is working with the community. So I probably do work more than I should, probably more than is healthy. Uh, and I think we'll probably get to that conversation, but 
the work I need to do for the university sits over here. I can just do that. But it's all the other stuff that that's important that I think is hopefully making a difference. It gets done off the side of my desk. And I'm okay with that because that is what drives me to do what I do. I think you have touched something here is the personal boundaries. You have said maybe work too much. And in one sense, we have discussed the way we maybe can make some boundaries with academia and choosing how we will do um, the research and how we will report back or what we accept and what we fight a little. But then how do we put personal boundaries in the kind of work that we do if we you know, engage with real people in the community that are maybe suffering from violence or marginalized communities or young people that have a voice but that is not heard? How do we say, okay, I have to take some time for myself now? I think it's mainly also the mm, to allow yourself that you have the possibility to take a break. So um, it's not like, okay, now I have to take a break, but understanding that it's important to reset and refresh yourself. This is a tricky question for me. It's the one that I feel most uncomfortable answering because no, I don't have an answer. I don't have a set of tips to support people going forward, but I love to hear your perspectives. And I fully, fully support uh, what you're saying, Jennifer, about self-care, of the analogy of using the life mask on the airplane, right? Of, of making sure you first give that to yourself in order to be able to support others around you. That's really important. Uh, and this is what I tell my students. I really do push the idea of of self-care, of making sure that you are building in time, you're building in breaks, because you can't continue to do the good work that you're doing unless you are building in that self-care routine. And academia is a place that will take advantage explicitly or implicitly. So it is critical. And yet I don't do it well. I, I do spread myself uh, too thin. So I, I liked that uh, analogy also. Vivek, of, of knowing where your loyalties lie. That is a, a really good tip, I think, in making sure that you are supporting the most important areas where you can put your energy. And I think we do need to, as academics, uh, support the notion that the work we do is hard, the way we do it is hard, and it has an impact on, on people. So I think we could more collectively work to support ourselves as well. So uh, the work that everyone in this room is, is doing in terms of social justice, we could turn that lens internally to look at uh, our colleagues who, who are struggling. I think we have gone through a journey here. And for me, it's very surprising, but also comforting to see that I feel like at home in these blurry lines, from what you have said, it's like constructive. That's where there is space to change things. I think I will see these blurry lines that I The past year I have felt very uncomfortable, but now maybe I can actually embrace the discomfort and see how I can work with them and actually seeing there's there, there are possibilities. If you have an idea for a podcast, please let us know. You can contact us by email at info4 at concordia.ca or find us on social media at CU Fourth Space. We'd love to hear from you. The Fourth Space podcast is hosted by me, Douglas Moffat, and produced with Anna Voklebeck. Editing by Chanel Lees Marshall and Maximus Delmar. Social media and web support by Kari Balmstead. And our theme music, courtesy of Supercontinent. Thanks for listening.